92.7 QLZ. It is Styles joined on the phone today by Sterling Gates, the uh, one of the guys, one of the three guys, right? The three behind yeah, this yeah. movie. All right. So the Post Human Project is the title of the film. If you are a superhero fan, this is right up your alley. And Sterling, to start off, can you kind of give me a quick synopsis on the film? Sure. It's um, it's a, a film about five teenagers uh, who are graduating college and moving on to a different phase of their life. They go on a rock climbing trip, a uh, celebratory rock climbing trip, because graduation's in a few days. While they're out in the wilderness in the middle of the woods, uh, some craziness happens, and they end up each getting superpowers, uh, and then chaos ensues. <laughs> And uh, I got to see the film actually this morning, and I got to tell oh, you what, cool. as, as a superhero fan, just based on, you know, I'm, I love comics and I love superhero movies, this is a great movie, man. The setup and the writing from the early part of the movie, which sets the story up to the final hour where it's just all in at once, man. Superb job on it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're obviously really proud of it, and we're really excited to see um, what happens with it. It's a... It's a very different type of uh, sort of superhero story, especially given today's superhero market, which is huge, uh, and every story is just massive. We try to tell this really grounded, sort of more personal superhero take um, about these kids and about how, how hard it is to be a teenager and about how you're going through a lot of change and how important all those changes are, and then what happens when you throw you know, super-powered abilities into the mix and how that affects you emotionally and how that affects where you are physically in life uh, and how either detrimental or great it can be to suddenly have the ability to teleport or throw fire out of your hands or have super strength or any of that stuff, you know. Um, but it was important to us to tell a really personal story. Um, and our, our main character is a kid named Denny Burke, and he's going through a lot of really hard stuff. And... Once he gets powers, they are both reflective of his wants and needs and, and desires, but they also come at a price and a cost. And him getting those powers affects his friends around him. Just like when you're a teenager and if something big happens to you, it can affect your closest friends instantly. Um, so it was really important to us to tell us a really kind of grounded, interesting story that wasn't about, you know, stopping yeah. an army of robots or, you know, stopping an alien invasion or anything like that. It was, it was about family and about the family that you make around you. Um, especially when you're a kid. I mean, when you're a kid, all you, sometimes you feel like all you've got is your friends and then everyone's against you, including your own family. And so it, it became, a, um, it just became the story about these relationships and how important they are to, to Denny and how they affect, um, everything that happens to him, including getting these crazy powers. Well, that's very, yeah, you're right on that, because the storyline, it's him and his younger brother, of course, um, and those two have a bit of a, a situation in themselves, along with their father missing. I mean, when it came down to writing these characters, obviously, as you said, Denny's is kind of, his powers are reflective of his wants. How did you guys decide the powers per character? Because we got the power of healing, we got the power of fire, super strength, teleportation, levitation... You know, a lot of that stuff was decided by the other writer-producer, Matthew Price, um, before before I got super heavily involved. Um, a lot of it has to do with each each power is reflective of either wants or, eat, or, or, or desires, or it's reflective of the character's personality. Um, and, and so as a result, I mean, it, it felt natural... It felt natural. Well, Denny is Denny wants to heal, and so to give him the the ability to heal himself or to heal others feels like a really natural fit. Or like Archie is super brainy, uh, but he's being bullied, and all he wants is the strength to stand up to the bullies. And so then, what happens if you flip it? And instead of getting a little bit of like you know inner strength, instead he suddenly can bend steel with his hands. Like, what does that do to him? It, it, it was just important, to, you know. It was important to us to tell like a really interesting story about these kids and and make sure that, you know, obviously I'd be lying if we said we didn't look at like the John Hughes m movies of the '80s um, and sort of take those Hughesian tropes uh, and character archetypes, and then you know, the, the, like the Breakfast Club. There's the jock, the nerd, the princess, the weirdo. Like 
take those tropes and then turn them on their head by introducing the idea of super-powered, superhuman abilities. Um, and what happens when you take the Breakfast Club and you give them powers far beyond those of mortal men, you know, and, and how do they react to that? Do they have the character to do the right thing or do they have the character to let things go horribly wrong? I mean, in, in Gwen's case, not to spoil anything, but like in Gwen's case, things don't go like she probably wants them to. Um, and things things get pretty hairy for her as a result of, of becoming pyrokinetic. Talking with Sterling Gates, 92.7 QLZ, the post-human project out now on VOD services, including iTunes. You mentioned that you, you had gotten involved at a certain point in the project. So how did you become a part of this? Uh, director Kyle Roberts and, and the other writer-producer, Matthew Price, reached out to me um, very early on in the process and asked if I would help um, sort of restructure some of their story beats and really build out a lot of their character stuff. Um, there was not, at one point we had talked about making it as a web series. And so they were very interested in making it episodic. Uh, and when you watch the film, you can see sort of how the episodes would have played out because we do those, those kind of comic book transitions and, and cl miniature cliffhangers and that kind of thing. So they, like they, because so much of my comic book work is serialized, they wanted me to come in and find ways to make it more serialized than than a regular 90-minute, you know, feature. Um, and so I rebroke that story and, and sort of started from the uh, from the ground up and restructured from the ground up uh, to try to make it to try to make it m more like a web more of a web series and mm -hmm. then. Late in the game, uh, we flipped it back and turned it into a ninety-minute feature. So, I was going to say because the, the the comic uh, panels and the and the chapter breakdowns in between was a very nice touch, given as you stated your uh, your background in comic book writing. Yeah, I mean it's it's a wink and a nod to the the genre, the genre and the medium that influences us. It, it's something I've never seen in a in a feature film before, so I thought that was really interesting and new and different. And, and it, you know, those transitions, it's so, like, it's very apparent we're taking a cue from John Hughes on the character stuff, and hopefully it'll be very apparent to audiences that we're taking cues from comic book, um, comic book structure w w when they see those first few transitions. Um, and, and that's just us being very uh, straightforward with our influences and, and wearing our influences on our sleeves very proudly. How long did this take you guys? Because you came in, you obviously we talked about how you came into the process. It, it, I read somewhere it was like somewhere around three years from start to finish pretty much from at least your involvement or am I wrong on uh, that? No, I mean that's total. From, from conception to release was three years and three months. Um, Matt and Kyle started on this journey in January of 2012. I got involved in April of 2012, uh, and we released May 1st, 2015. So, you know, I mean, it took us about a year to lock the script down and do fundraising. When you do a in independent feature like this, um, you know, the, the onus of fundraising is on you and your – you know, it, we, we did a lot of different um, avenues. We did an Indiegogo campaign. We did um, fundraising dinners. A lot of people donated their time and work to help us uh, to help us fund this film. Then we shot uh, summer 2013. We cut uh, we cut it together summer 2013, and then we started post production. And as you can imagine. The, just the volume of special effect shots on a project like this, especially on a project that has such a limited budget and limited resources, um, that creates its own set of problems. And so we had three special effects guys, our director, Kyle Roberts, a guy named Andy Seafried, and another guy named Brooks McGinnis, that were basically working nights and weekends to do special effects shots. Um, and that was a 10-month-long process uh, wow. in post. And so, and I mean, it, like, what's crazy is there are 540 special effects shots of some kind in this small indie film, which uh, is a higher number of special effects shots than the first Matrix movie or than the first Star Wars movie uh, or the first Lord of the Rings movie. 
Now, when you're writing this, because as you said, you're on a micro budget, did that affect you, your role in writing the film? And oh, kind totally. Of having totally. To I mean, stuff? you've got to, like, budget is always the first, like, all of your favorite, when you write, all of your favorite sequences will be cut because of budget reasons, <laughs> almost every time. And so you've got to plan for not having a high budget, and you've got to plan for doing, like, creating sequences that fit the characters and can be sort of really cool um, moments using superpowers, but you have to keep in mind that you can't afford to do, you know, like like Archie gets super strength. Well, he can't pick up a car, you know? Like, so you've got to find moments that can demonstrate that ability, but at the same time are affordable and cool, which is like where stuff like the bullet catch comes from. Uh, spoiler alert, I guess. But like the bullet catch was a really simple effect and it's a simple bit of storytelling, but it's a really cool beat um, that you can do with almost no money. Um, you just have to build, you, you, you know, you've got to make the bullet that he catches, and then you whip pan the camera, and the actor throws his arm out. You lay in a sound effect, and then it's all about the reaction. You know, and, and then he looks at his hand, and there's a flattened bullet, and then it's, it's the actor's reaction that sells that beat. And I, that's one of my favorite moments in the film, uh, that bullet catch beat because Colin Place is so um, completely believable when he looks at that flattened bullet and he smiles and he says, I caught a bullet. Uh, it's, it's a great moment, but it's a moment that you have to think when you're writing, you've got to think, well, there's no money to have him pick up a car and throw it. So I got to have a really cool small beat and rely on the talent of other people to really help sell that moment and to help make it a, feel like it's a really big uh emotional beat when we go into the special effects one of my favorite scenes from it is is it adam is his name the guy who has the teleportation Teleport. yeah yeah, yeah. Adam okay. Hall. so adam has teleportation and you do a scene which is a i'm going to reference nightcrawler here is completely like nightcrawlered out in the fighting aspect i mean that there had to be a lot to go into that scene in itself yeah i mean it's <laughs> again it's trying to find moments you can pull off with no money and kyle was very very smart in how he shot that scene and how he did that whole special effects sequence. I, I think in the script, that scene is like two pages long. Wow. Um, and just because I was trying to describe all the different, you know, I, there's a lot of different things you can do when someone can teleport like that. And so that scene went from being two pages in the script and, and it was just like, well, we can't really afford to do a lot of teleporting, we can do some, so let's cut that down into something a little more manageable and make it um, and, and make it as big a fight as we can. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. I, I think that, that sequence is really cool, uh, and I want more, personally. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, every, time, every time he teleports and Finch hits a wall or something where his body was, I, I just smile because it's such a cool but very simple and easy-to-do um, special effect. And it's again, it all comes down to budget. And when when you're working on, on a film like this that is so, um, that you, like you want it to feel like it's huge, but you have to be aware that there's not money to do huge, crazy, big stuff. Um, and you can't like stuff that other productions, bigger productions, would have no problem doing. You know, for us, it, it's a hurdle we can't overcome just because we don't have the money. Mm -hmm. I, I did the math at one point, and like 30 seconds of Man of Steel is our entire budget. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like a day of shooting on Man of Steel would is probably six or seven times our budget. I mean, it's, it's hard because, you know, we're an independent production out of Oklahoma trying to tell a story on the same level as Hollywood blockbusters, trying to tell a story on that level. Audiences will determine how successful we were, but um, but we're trying to do something uh, on the same level as guys that have a hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars at their disposal, and and we have nowhere near that. You know, we're, we're we literally shot in people's backyards at one point. So, you know, we did the best with the resources we had. The state of Oklahoma, which is where we shot, where we're all from, everyone in Oklahoma was so gracious and so fantastic to work with and they have you know the reception oklahoma has been great i think in part because a oklahoma is the greatest 
state for friendly people that want to help out. But B, no one's ever attempted to do anything like this before um, in Oklahoma. And so a lot of people wanted to help us just because it's something that Oklahoma's never had before. And I, I can't thank the, the Oklahoma filmmaking community enough for all their hard work um, and for all of their resources that they opened up for us for next to nothing just because they knew we were on such a limited budget. Well, and you guys did such a great job with it. And I'm, I'm going to say this not just because you're on the phone, but because I truly feel this way. My girlfriend asked me this morning how I liked the movie. And though you had a limited budget, it doesn't feel like it, though. Thanks. It really doesn't. It is a solid Thank movie you. from front That's to great. back. And story, you. you're welcome. Story's good. The graphics are really good. I love the uh, the flame throwing, and of course, like I've mentioned before, the te- teleportation. Um, when it comes to these characters, you've written you you know obviously you write comics. Are we going to see more from them in maybe a sequel, or is there maybe a comic down the line for them? We're in talks. Um, we're in talks. We're we're trying to determine what happens next. For all of us, I mean, this was three years of our lives, yeah. and I think right now I, I'm just so sort of elated that it's been released and that we we secured distribution, which is really tough in the indie film world to secure worldwide distribution like we did. Um, I'm so happy that we did that. Right now, I just want to sit back and sort of wait and see how audiences respond to it and see if see if there's a demand. Um, for more stories of these characters. We have stories in mind. We have different mediums in mind, depending on, depending on the story. Um, I mean, the great thing about comics is there is no budget in comics. You're only limited by the abilities of whoever's drawing um, the story. And so you can have, you can do a double-page spread of the entire Green Lantern Corps and not worry about it. But in order to, to shoot that... There are so many factors that come into play, it, it, can, it can become super restrictive. So comics are, comics are a different type of storytelling because you're never worried about, well, can, I, can we afford to have you know, Green Lantern and 700 of his friends show up on two pages? Um, whereas if, you, you know, if you're shooting, you can maybe afford Ryan Reynolds, maybe, to show up, maybe. <laughs> um, and it's just it's a different world and it's a different type of storytelling. And so we've considered, well, if we do a comic that allows us to tell any story we want. And so it's like suddenly having that suddenly having the ability to do anything you want, well now you gotta wonder, well, what should we do with that ability? Um, now the yeah, now it's endless possibilities, so where do we go right. next? And and so but I think there's it's different audiences and different markets. I mean, not everyone that sees a comic book movie is gonna read a comic book. And so people are, you know, uh, people are more prone to see a comic book movie than to read a comic book in, in today's market. And so how limiting does that, how limiting is that for an audience? Should we push on making more live action stuff because there's a higher chance for an audience or should we do comic books because we can do anything we want in them? Um, and that, that creates a really, I mean, it's a great set of problems to have because we're still, regardless of what we're talking about, we're still talking about moving this, these characters forward in their lives and seeing where they go next. Um, you know, and, and as evidenced in the film, like each character has a different response to what happens to them. And so they're, at some point, they're all going to go different ways because I think these powers are going to either unite them or drive them apart, depending on any number of factors. And I'd like to explore that for sure. I, like, again, we've talked a lot about, like, what's the future for these characters? And my, my shorthand answer is, I don't know. Um, we're waiting to see how people react to the first one before we dig in and commit to another three years to do a second feature. Right. Well, this so far, you got 11 awards. I was just reading over at SterlingGates.com. You got 11 awards for the film, official selection at last year's San Diego Comic-Con. That's got to make you feel good just to start as you get out there on the VOD services. We've been very fortunate, for sure. Um, we've been very fortunate with the festival circuit, uh, and we were, we've been very fortunate with comic conventions. Um, you know, it's, it's so unusual for someone to make a low-budget superhero story. And I think a lot of people initially come in to sort of see the novelty of it, and then hopefully the story bowls them over um, and keeps them in their seats uh, and keeps them interested um, because it's, 
you know, we, like I said, we try to tell a really personal story and I, I'm hopeful that the story is what, what interests people the most. Um, and it seems to have done well for us, uh, through the festival circuit, you know, yeah, and, and playing at Comic-Con was so unusual because, you know, I go to Comic-Con every year as a comic book writer, uh, and to suddenly like show up and be there to promote my small indie film was such a weird shift in in perspective. Um, were you uh, were you nervous at the first screenings, and were you nervous when the first reviews started rolling out? Oh sure, I'm I'm I'm, I'm still nervous about reviews and about screenings and about what people think. I mean, there's whenever you put work out in the world, there's no way to stop yourself from being nervous. I don't think. I mean, that's just, maybe that's just how I operate. But mm-hmm. um, no, the first screening we did was a cast and crew screening, and the reception was was overwhelmingly positive. Um, and then the next big screening we did was Dead Center Film Festival. We premiered at Dead Center Film Festival, which is Oklahoma City's, um, I think, largest film festival. And we debuted the lights came up and and they came over and said hey you know we'd like to announce that um post human project is the winner of best oklahoma film which is this really rad award that dead center gives out that is voted on by every film critic in the state um wow that's awesome so i i lost it like i got like tears in my eyes like lost it because again you know we are so blessed to work with that filmmaking community in Oklahoma and to be rewarded by, by the critic circle was a really big deal for me. Um, and, and I completely like at at that point I was like, well, nothing can top this (laughs) (laughs) for us, the festival circuit. I mean, for most independent films, the festival circuit is where you're going to get the most notice initially and hopefully you find distribution. And that, that's always the biggest hurdle on indie films. Um, and it's tough. It's a tough market. And we fortunately um, were eventually picked up by Gravitas Ventures for this VOD release. And, and it's been a really wild ride. And I'm, I'm very thankful that Gravitas took, even took notice of us because you know, distribution is the last big hurdle for independent films. And it can be detrimental if you don't get distribution and so all those years of work kind of go down the drain so it's uh, you know it's very gratifying and i feel very fortunate that that kyle was able to hook up with with gravitas and and find us distribution well the post human projects out now and all those uh, vod services what is it itunes google play out there you're on xbox the playstation network i think voodoo uh maybe amazon um it, it, we're populating. We're slowly populating out to all the VOD systems. Are we going to so. see a DVD release of this eventually, or are we just going to stick with VOD? You know, I, I don't have a good answer for that. We um, we recorded a commentary over last Christmas, so I, I assume there are plans for, for a home video release. Um, but I, I, I honestly don't know. I think VOD is the best place for, for people to see it right now. All right, title of the film is The post Human Project, Star- talking with Sterling Gates. L- to finish up here with uh, two more questions, the first one, what's your biggest takeaway from this project? Because obviously it's a labor of love. You spent th- over three years on it. What's your biggest takeaway? You know, I, I got mostly involved because my friends were making this. And when you get involved with anything with some of your closest friends, it, it can either go well or it can go really badly. Um, post-human's sort of been a mixed bag. There's always conflict in any creative endeavor. Uh, but I'm most thankful that, that I got involved because Matt Price asked me to, to do this, and I think we're closer friends as a result. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for Matt, and he's, he's now a, you know, an even closer friend than he was before, and that's, that's been really... That, that makes me really happy. And, and if anything comes out of three years of work... For me, the the best thing is I'm closer to one of my friends than I was at the start of this. That is awesome. And lastly, what's up next for you? Obviously, I know you have your comic book work. Can you kind of hint at what you're working at next, or is it top secret? I can hint. Um, (laughs) Sure, I can hint. Uh, There's more comics coming down the line. Um, If you you follow my my comic work, you know I'm I'm pretty heavily involved in in, uh, superhero books. 
um, for some of the bigger companies. So th- there are things coming down the line, and then I'm developing other comic book projects outside of superheroes. You know, I, I really I love telling superhero stories, but I really feel like I've told so many over the years. You know, I've written a couple hundred comics. Like, I'm ready to explore some different types of stories and different types of storytelling. And so I'm developing, I'm working with some really cool artists to develop um, books that I don't think people would expect me to do, just different types of stories and different different types of storytelling. Cool. Well, we look um, and forward then, to that. Yeah, I, I, it's been super fun. It's been really different to write a story about, you know, kind of ordinary people dropped into extraordinary situations instead of writing about, you know, extraordinary people dealing with super extraordinary situations, you know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, there's always talk of, of doing more more live action work. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been so gratifying on a lot of levels um, to work with this cast and crew and, and to develop develop friendships with all of them now i'm starting to look back like well maybe that's a that's an interesting path and and we work with some great producers in oklahoma um wendy parker and sheree green uh and and they're they're really like on me about developing a project for them to to produce so um so so there are things there are things in the future it's just a matter of you know waiting until i can actually talk about them but i say it sounds like you got your hands in a lot of things going on right now so it's a matter of which one's going to get out first i can only ask people that follow my work, I can only ask for their patience because things take time to obviously post human. I mean, that, that was three years. Um, and for the first couple of years, I didn't really feel confident telling anybody about it because we were still working on it. Um, and now it's, it's out and I, I'm shouting to the world as much as possible on Twitter or on Tumblr or anything like just trying to let people know it's out there because we don't have a huge marketing budget, you know, like mm-hmm. we don't have, you know, like the Avengers has done, uh, uh, like I counted, the Avengers has done 46 different TV commercials oh. to pump Avengers that run, and they're like 30 second spots or a minute spots. Like we don't even have TV commercials. <laughs> um, we can't even afford TV commercials. We're just trying to get the word out on a film that that we made in Oklahoma for very little money, and, and we're doing the best we can. And so. Hopefully, people will discover us and, and we'll find an audience and, and, you know, and hopefully that audience will like it enough to follow the rest of us into our next projects. All right. Well, Sterling Gates, thank you so much for the time, brother. Post Human Project is the title of the film. It's out now on a plethora of VOD services from iTunes to Amazon to Google Play. So make sure you guys go check it out. And uh, I definitely recommend it as a superhero movie buff. If you haven't stopped by in a while, check out WQLZ.com. Yeah, the website is awesome. For the concert calendar, music news, blogs, and the couch podcast. It's good to catch up on all the good stuff I missed. WQLZ.com.